Uh, my name is Elaine Moore and I am a clinical midwifery manager um, with NHS Ayrshire and Arran and I'm based at Ayrshire Maternity Unit. Um, I was a community midwife for 10 years before taking up my managerial role um, and as part of my remit in the community I did have a responsibility for caring for families with vulnerabilities um, and that was difficult uh, at that time. Um, and realised that maybe there was another way that we, we could do things, but really didn't have the opportunity to be able to do uh, that as a, as a clinical practitioner. So this is a wee bit about the story about how the Vulnerable Families team actually came about in Ayrshire. Um, this is a quote that we use quite a lot from the Scottish Government that came out in 2011 and we actually used it um, when we were trying to put forward our vision as to why we felt that there should be an increased continuity for vulnerable families. Um, so it, it, to me it's fundamental around about what the rights of the child are um, and even the unborn child um, and we do have the opportunity now to actually place children on the unborn um, at risk register, which is something that really came about at this time. So why a vulnerable family service? Well, everybody else, there's lots and lots of policy drivers. In Scotland, we had getting our priorities right, the introduction of a high-risk pregnancy protocol in Ayrshire which started in 2004 but basically evolved to what we then had in 2012 when we were going forward um, with this service. With the early years framework, the national guidance, pathway for vulnerable families, as I say, you know, every area is the same. You have a plethora of national drivers that influence how you are going to make a service work. But the hard thing for services is actually having the time to put it all together and put a vision forward that makes use of that guidance that's actually going to make a difference um, to the families that you care for. Again, on top of um, all the national information that we were getting around about what we should be doing, we needed to gather local intelligence around about what were we doing just now so that we could look at how we could then change that to make it more family friendly and to actually achieve outcomes that showed and demonstrated change in particular to our multi-agency partners. Um, so to start off we had 40 community midwives across Ayrshire um, all with, with a responsibility for caring for vulnerable families. We had inequity in numbers of families per midwife um, and that included fam families who come under the green pathway. So we'd have some midwives whose caseloads were predominantly green pathway, some midwives whose um, care pathway was predominantly red pathway under the keeping childbirth natural and dynamic um, pregnancy pathway. Um, green pathway women are women who have uh, come under the criteria of normal pregnancy um, and would then go on to have um, low risk, low, uh, basically low, low risk midwifery care. Um, red pathway are women who have increased risk through medical or social reasons who would require um, for their multi-agency input, not just medical input. Um, so with the inequity that was there, we had midwives who had a lot of women like this on their caseload, but who didn't have many green pathway and vice versa. Um, social services weren't always aware of who the midwife was for a given woman in her family because we can have 14, 15 community midwives in North Ayrshire and any one of those midwives could be that particular family's named midwife. Um, so that meant that they get confused. They were maybe phoning sometimes two and three different midwives before they finally got the midwife they were looking for, so it was hard for them to identify. 
We had a multi-agency case record review in North Ayrshire in 2010, and that showed inconsistency in the standard of child protection risk assessments that were undertaken by midwives. And there was also an inconsistency in the understanding and thresholds around about when a family should be identified as being at risk. Um, and there was an increasing number of women and families designated as vulnerable. Um, in particular, utilising the new child protection inclusion criteria, which was part of the wider work that was done nationally. So we had to try and find a way where we could actually work within that. So our vision was we wanted to work within the local constraints that we had and within the national policies that we had. And our vision was to provide a holistic and innovative service to women. And this was actually from the identification of pregnancy right through to the postnatal period. We had looked to actually provide an intrapartum care, but that's really difficult um, because of the number of case conferences and um, code groups that the midwives have to actually attend. And it is a small group. But what we wanted to do was to make it as holistic as we possibly could and keep that continuity as much as we possibly could. To provide seamless non-judgmental care in partnership with women and including their families, um, Sometimes people look at the, the women in isolation, forgetting they actually do have a wider um, family and they have a wider social support, um, which might be to the good or not, depending on who that support is. And to improve multi-agency working um, and information sharing, because that's really, really uh, important because what we were finding was is that a lot of children um, at birth were actually being placed um, either on the at-risk register or actually being removed from their mothers at birth. And this is because the risk assessments weren't robust enough, and that's what the multi-agency um, record review actually showed us. So how did we do it? Well, they had to, it had to be introduced within existing resources, and this was even back then in 2009-2010, because we didn't have any extra money for this. We weren't getting any new midwifery support. So what we actually had to do was look at what we delivered. So we did an audit, and we audited how many women we had in each midwife's caseload, how many were red pathway, how many were green pathway, how many were red pathway due to um, social uh, reasons and um, child protection reasons. Um, and we also looked at the number of clinics that were done, um, how many women were there in each of these clinics, how many midwives did we have doing visits out with our, our particular um, boundaries, because we've got three local authorities. And what it actually showed us is that, and I think what we learned from it, we thought we knew our service, we thought we knew what we were doing and what the midwives were doing, but actually it highlighted that if we worked differently, that within the pilot site in North Ayrshire, which was the area that we chose to start off, we could actually free up um, 37 and a half hours of a midwife, t midwife time, which was one whole time equivalent. So. What we then did is, is we thought, right, okay, we can do that. Um, we spoke with our partners, um, social services, um, our chair protection advisors, um, and um, we thought, how can we do this? How can we support the midwives to do this? So we took North Asia as a pilot. We looked at the women that we had, and we started our first um, vulnerable family service. Um, we audited it regularly. We met every week in the first instance, and we had to do that to ensure that the midwives were being supported. They met with the child protection advisor every week, um, and it really made a difference. What we did is we had one whole time equivalent, and that was then split between two midwives, and that was to keep the continuity. And um, We weren't sure were we were going to have burnout. We had one midwife decide that this wasn't what they wanted to do. So we, we, they had part of a caseload in the vulnerable families and part in what would seem to be normal midwifery. 
and that worked really, really well because it meant that when one of the midwives was in holiday, the other one could cover that caseload. So there was that continuity. So these women knew that they would either have Mary or they would have um, Marion. So these were the two midwives. What we actually found from that is, is that the, the risk assessments were much more robust. The information that was gathered was much more in depth. Midwives felt that those two midwives felt much more comfortable in the case discussion arena to be able to discuss with their concerns. Social services had two midwives who they could contact now for all the women in North Asia, rather than having. 15 midwives to try and contact to find the right one. The midwives were very, um, how can I put it? I'm trying to think of the word here. Um, but they were very confident in actually being able to work with the women um, around about, you know, some of the hard questions that they have to ask and some of the difficulties they can get finding the answers that they need to get. Um, so. It was really a learning curve for us. It didn't happen um, all at the one time. We implemented it in accordance with the National Guidance for Child Protection. But what we actually did with that is, is we modelled some other things into it that we felt were um, effective that maybe wasn't actually within the, the national guidance. But the big thing about this is, is it continues to evolve and adapt to changes in a proactive manner. And I'll talk about some of these later on. One of the other big things, and I think this was the first time it was actually said um, for us in Scotland anyway at a national level, was it's about the, the significant role midwives have to play in identifying these risk factors to the unborn child um, and to the family. Um, because I think before people felt that, well, it wasn't the role of the midwife, that was the role of the social worker or it was the role of the family worker or it was the role of the, the um, voluntary sector. But this was the first time it was actually crystallised and actually said that, well, no, actually, we have a very valuable part to play in how we care for these particular um, families. So the aims of our service was early assessment and identification, but also working as the women's advocate to identify agency supports required and ensure those supports were put in place to improve the health and well-being for women and their families. Sometimes what would happen is we would identify that a woman needed something, but it, nobody was taking that forward to say that this is what was to happen for them. With the introduction of the service, this became very much part of what we do on a daily basis. And the other thing as well is, is to provide that ongoing non-judgmental care, um, because at the end of the day, these women don't always follow the path the way that we would like them to. You know, if, if they're um, have issues with substance misuse, they don't automatically stop. They might go back a bit. But what we always say is, is trying to get that non judgmental through, well, that's okay, but that's a part of recovery. So, if that's part of your recovery, what have you learned for that? How can we support you with that and moving forward? Aims again, the continuity of care of terror is absolutely crucial. Um, before, like I say, with 40 midwives, these women were coming to normal antenatal clinics. In the antenatal clinics, they felt judged. Um, it, it added to their stress and their anxiety. They felt that nobody really understood what they were going through. That appointment was a very quick appointment. No time to really sit and discuss the in depth the issues that they were having. So what we did is, is we actually set up our own clinic for these ladies. Um, giving them a good half an hour appointment every time they come and see us. Um, it's multi-agency working uh, in accordance with our Getting It Right for Every Child guidelines. Um, and it provides parent support in a one-to-one, -one, but also in a group setting, because it gave us the opportunity to actually set up um, specific antenatal education classes for this client group, um, where everybody coming to the group had the same issues and they didn't again feel judged. So this is the referral criteria which I'm sure is the same for everybody else. There really wouldn't be anything in there that's different. Um, and then 
the the protocol that we have is is that when we initially meet these women, we have a discussion, and then um, what we do is is uh, we then do further investigations. I don't like the word investigations. I, I think it's further history taken around about what their social history is rather than investigations. Um, we have a weekly discussion with the, uh, about new referrals with the Child Protection Advisor, and this is to ensure that the midwives can debrief. But the other thing as well is to ensure that we are consist consistently taking on board new practice um, and changing as we go along. And then the decision as well, we have a when we're having that discussion around with the Child Protection Advisor, what we then do is, is we'll, we will then decide does this family really need to be referred to um, the vulnerable families team, uh, sorry, the child protection team with the vulnerable families team being involved, or can the vulnerable families team care for them on their own, um, providing support um, and uh, ensuring that other agencies are involved, but they don't need to go into the child protection process to have that done. So this is just a wee bit of how we do it. Um, the women are booked, they seem to be in the high risk. Um, pregnancy, the criteria is met. They then are referred to the vulnerable family midwife following the 12 week gestation scan. Although we're moving towards now that what will happen is, and this is actually being tested as a test of change at this moment in time in South Asia, is, is that as soon as the high risk pregnancy criteria is met, the referral will be made to the vulnerable family midwife instead of waiting for the scan because what we're finding is, is the earlier intervention we can get, the better. Um, because obviously then what we're doing is, is we're building up the relationships. Um, and if that works then obviously we would roll that out to the other two localities. Again, this is just what we were saying a wee bit earlier on. Um, the pre-birth assessment will be the same or very similar to pre-birth assessments that are undertaken elsewhere. They are extremely in-depth. The women and their families are involved right at the very beginning. Um, and what it does is, is it helps us understand the things that we need to put in place. It must be completed by 20 to 22 weeks gestation. That's part of the legislation that we have. And any concerns identified um, through social services as well. We have a pre-birth case conference, um, and then if there's no ident, I can't get that. Um, no immediate concerns identified, then we would go straight to the vulnerable family team, but they can re-refer at any time if a, an issue comes up that we weren't aware of. So, what we do here is we give individualised care. We do a mixture of antenatal, home and clinic visits, continuous assessment of need, and that's really important, and that again is where the continuity comes in. If you've got that continuity, then you can assess continuously because you're seeing them through that journey. The intensive support, you are working as a woman uh, and that family's advocate, and now since the service has been up, up and running for a few years, we actually are having women who are returning to the service um, that maybe initially have been in the service and go through the child protection um, route, but this time round have came back and what's actually happening is, is that they've been cared by the team, but there is no longer social work um, involvement. Provide parent and family support, and we do, if we can, um, a visit up until 28 days postnatally. The women really, really trust the midwives. They allow them access to their life that they don't allow many other health professionals or social services. Um, and they are quite honest sometimes to the point of being blunt. Um, and that's a two-way streak. Sometimes the women are that way as well with the midwives. But there is that degree of honesty there, which is really, really important. These, I think, I've kind of touched on them through what I've been talk talking about. Um, at the end of the day, it's just really a wee repeat. And the thing is, is we do attend the four uh, weekly code group meetings for um, families that actually are in the Child Protection Register. And again, it's this communication between maternity staff and external agencies that's absolutely crucial. 
this is a table um, because one of the things as well that we were looking at was is how do, how do we measure what we're doing? How can we show that we're making a difference? And and really, the most basic way was round about the unborn um, ch children in the sorry unborn babies in the child protection register and the child protection orders at birth. Um, and as you can see um, through the tables, that although there's been an increase in referrals, um, and initially, you know, like the first year it ran, then the second year, there was an increase in unborn babies in the child protection register. The year 2013 to, to 2014, there actually was a decrease, because I think that's because what happens is, is that you get better at your referral criteria. Um, uh, at the end of the day, and you recognise when you need to put supports in earlier. Um, and as you can see, that a year on year we've actually managed to decrease the child protection orders at birth. Um, I'm waiting on the new numbers for 2014, 2015.